Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Beth Horsington on behalf of the Strathmore Speaker Series. Thanks so much for stopping in here tonight for our first event of the 2022 season. We used to hold these events at the Fire Barn in Onondaga Park in the Strathmore neighborhood, but COVID necessitated a switch to Zoom. So the Onondaga Free Library is providing the technical assistance we need to bring you this program, and we thank them for their expertise and generosity. And generosity. The Strathmore Speaker Series is made possible through the support of the City of Syracuse, the Gifford Foundation, the Greater Strathmore Neighborhood Association, and donations from people like you. We like to provide our speakers with an honorarium, so if you would like to support this, go to our website, strathmorespeakers.com, and you'll see a donation button on the landing page. Every dollar is greatly appreciated. Tonight, our guest speaker is Bill Kaufman. He is an entrepreneur and small business owner who turned his passion for honeybees and beekeeping into a full-time profession. Bill's company, It's All Better, offers a residential bee removal service and both free and paid beekeeping classes. He is also a member of the Syracuse Area Beekeepers Club and founder of the Central New York Beekeeper School. A brief question and answer session will follow Bill's talk, so stick with us. And now, please welcome our speaker, Bill Kaufman. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'll get right to sharing my screen here. All right. You got it? Yeah. All yeah. right. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Bill Kaufman, and I am a uh, Cornell certified master beekeeper. That's a uh, it's a lot of fun. It was a two year degree. Uh, it's, it's not really a degree; it's a certification. But it's a two year program, uh, and I got to put something in front of my name, master beekeeper. Let's see. My first um, my first title was uh, the art. And in uh, of Zen in beekeeping, and then it changed. And my oh, all right, that's all the technical difficulties for now. And then I saw beekeeping then and now, so we just got a mix of both. If we got time, we're going to talk mostly about what bees are, where they come from, what do we do with them. And then at the end, I'll talk about a little bit of the Zen of beekeeping if we have enough time. And uh, you can ask me, I'll give you questions to ask me because I know I can't cover everything in this. There is just the bees and honeybees is such an amazing world that um, there's just no way I can cover everything I would love to cover in this half an hour here. I want to share my family with you up here on the, uh, the, the guy with glasses there on the left. That's my son. My son Stanley is 15. He's holding my son Bradley, the youngest, who's three. Uh, this picture was in 2019. We were out uh, up at Old Forge, you know, before the pandemic hit. Uh, my girl in blue, she is eight now. That's Charlie. And the pink in pink is Natalie. She is now seven. Charlie's going to be nine in, in February, so I can't forget that. She would, if she was here, she wouldn't let you forget that. And that is my wife. She just had a birthday. She's 29 again. And my birthday was yesterday. Let's see. Here's my kids. Uh, these are some of the bee suits that, that I have and sell. Uh, one of the very few things that I sell besides honey. Because um, there was a big thing, a big turning point in my life is when I actually got a bee suit. And that's what really changed my focus in life to bees was the bee suit. Here's Charlie. I believe this was 2019 again. This was at the state fair in the in the gazebo where they keep the bees. Uh, that's a great place to go. If um, you ever get to the state fair again, <laughs> if it ever opens up fully, I don't think we had a gazebo of bees there this year. I know I didn't even attend. Uh, but hopefully next year I will be able to, and we'll have the gazebo there again. Great live demonstration. There's always somebody there to talk about bees, and, and again, there's just so much to share. It's, a, it's an amazing hobby, amazing passion. 
here's Stanley. Uh, this is at a house way out there someplace. I can't even remember. It was about an hour and a half from home here. I'm in Bridgeport, and that was quite a quite a distance away. That's what what I do is a, for a living now is do what's called a cutout. And cutouts are when when uh, bees take up residence in somebody's home. You can't just call an exterminator. And I got some more pictures coming up. You'll see it, see why. But uh, Stanley's never too happy when I take the camera out. Hey, Stanley, look, look smile. And he just does. <laughs> but, um, I mean, as you can see, my daughter and my son, both holding bees, no protection. Don't do this at home. We're professionals. <laughs> Uh, bees have their temperaments. They uh, all have their own personalities, and I wouldn't let this happen if they were bees that were going to sting. Little something else at home I like to share. Um, my little guy right there in the middle, the little gray rooster, and his flock. Uh, nobody likes roosters around here because they're loud, but this guy, uh, his name is Rotisserie. He's just a little quiet guy. And he's he's part of our family too. Uh, we were hoping he'd we'd get some uh, hatching eggs from him, but he misses the mark <laughs> every time. <laughs> but he's fun to have around. Uh, this is out in my yard. If anybody ever comes to visit, uh, this is this is what you'll see. Uh, this is a swarm. That's why there is just so many bees in the air. And I was never this brave. Uh, you know, you could see my kids with bees. But um, I had to instill that on them, that uh, you can be brave around bees, because I sure wasn't for a long time. So I figured for this, I'll do uh, a lot of question and answer. I'll, uh, I'll, I've got a lot of questions that I lined up here that I, I figured I'd, were um, most important to, to most people. I did a poll on Facebook yesterday and said, what do you want to know? And so that's what's going on here. For me, I started beekeeping in 1999. Uh, I've been beekeeping bees for 17 years, but I the thought came into my head in 1999. So it took me a while after this to get bees because I had a, a crazy fear of swarming insects. I'd have night terrors. Uh, I grew up in, in Brewerton next to the Cicero Swamp, and out of the swamp comes swarms of bugs, Mostly ones that bite, like, you know, huge mosquitoes and things. Uh, I, I'm guessing that's where that came from. I had an experience when I was uh, young, probably three or so, in the single digit someplace, where I stood on a rotten stump and, and the ground bees came out and they stung me. So that probably had something to do with it. So anyway, 1999 came along and it was the next year was what we called Y2K. And I'm sure most of you remember Y2K. The uh had what was called the Millennium Bug. And well, nobody was to survive. All the banks were gonna go back to zero, everybody's gonna be dirt poor, we're gonna have nuclear meltdowns and all the video game high scores were gonna be reset to zero. And that was just gonna be awful. So I personally uh not not to become a prepper, I know a lot of people came out there and started digging bunkers and things. But I wanted to be self-sufficient in case something actually did happen and we couldn't have grocery stores or the supply train broke down or we couldn't leave the house or, you know, kind of like what's been going on the last couple of years. And uh, part, of, part of that was getting chickens. Now, I'd like to have other animals, but I got four kids, so I just don't have time for more animals. Uh, and the other part was the bees. You know, the bees is, you know, get that... Um, nice honey the uh liquid gold as some some call it it's great for for um trading i've i've traded all kinds of things for honey and anyway it took me again about 4 years 5 years after y2k after i started thinking i wanted bees to get bees mostly because i had to get over my fear but it stuck with the, in the thought so I actually i actually went out and did it Uh, how often you get stung all the time. When I first got bees, I would uh, I got a cotton, nice cotton suit, 
and what's called a, a safari helmet with a beekeeper veil. So the, the veil goes over the helmet and then it zippers in to the to the cotton suit. <clears throat> Excuse me. It zippers into the cotton suit, so there's no way for bees to get in, and you have nice like nice long leather gloves that go all the way up to the elbow. It's supposed to prevent bees from stinging you. But turns out with a thin cotton suit, bees can sting through it. It still happens. And I was terrified. Every time I went out, I was going to get stung. Getting stung hurts. And it still hurts. I've been stung thousands and thousands of times. I'll go, uh, some days I'll get stung up to 75, 100 times now uh, because, because of what I do. And you'll see why in, in a couple pictures here. Uh, then I'd go out. Uh, after that cotton suit, I knew it didn't work. I just put on sweatshirts, flannels, and several layers enough so that when the bees stung, they wouldn't their stingers weren't long enough to get through the layers. And then I'd use duct tape around my neck, to keep the veil down. I'd put it around my wrists and around my ankles and everything else, and and seal myself up pretty good. It didn't always work. What would happen is I'd bring some bees back into the house. I'd take with this protective gear off, and he'd sting me. So it just it just kept going. I call them kamikaze bees. Uh, World War II, I believe it was, when we discovered that Japanese had an affinity for kamikazes. That was a very noble position in their culture. Uh, you were giving your life for your society, for your people. And honeybees are the same way. If they're going to sting, they're giving their lives for their colonies. It's a very noble job that those honeybees have. And they don't want to do it. But when they're, uh, in, they will, when they feel they're threatened. This is a stinger on the right. Obviously, it's a fish hook on the left. The stinger is barbed just like a fish hook. So when a stinger gets into uh, the elastic skin of a, of a mammal, it will actually stick in there. And it's hard to see in this picture. This is a, a highly zoomed-in picture. It is, um, if you took a pin, let's say, out of your dry cleaning, those little tiny pins with a little metal head, I mean, there are some of the thinnest pins going. This is about a quarter or less the size of the point. I mean, it is the, um, if you put the, put the pin under the same magnification, it would look like a round ball at the end rather than a, a point. So it really isn't the stinger itself that hurts when you get stung. Through this, it's uh, it's three parts. Uh, two parts that move in a center channel where poison is, um, is passed through into the skin. And it's like an acid. It will rupture blood cells, breaks down cellular membranes, and causes lots of pain. When the bee stings, what happens is it gets stuck in there. And it leaves when the bee leaves, it leaves behind the sting, the stinger apparatus, which is the, uh, you can see there on the guy's knuckle, a uh, big chunk of, uh, like it's like a muscle. It's a gland with muscles. And it helps drive the stinger deeper and deeper. And it pumps, it's, there's a venom sac there, and it continues to pulsate and pump the venom into the skin. The bee leaves that, and it leaves a few of its entrails there, and is doomed to die. That's just, just how it works. The kamikaze bee does its duty and goes off to die. So, I get stung a lot. <laughs> and this is part of the reason why. I don't know if it's because I'm crazy or just dumb. Uh, you ask my wife, it's probably just because I'm dumb. Those are silly choices. Uh, nobody should hang out with bees with uh, shorts and a t-shirt. Unless you really know what's going on. Now, here is two different cutouts. One's in, uh, in an attic space, and the other one's in a wall of a church. And you can see the, like the, the size of the, the nest that is built, the wax comb. There could be up to 100 pounds or more of honey in this. 
uh, 20 to 30 pounds of, of bees and larvae and eggs. Um, if you, if you called in an exterminator, all that is going to rot in your wall. It's going to invite other pests like mice and, and moths and beetles and, and the like. And then the honey's going to leak down your wall. You're going to have a mess. It's going to come out across the floor and through your ceiling. And if somebody's got honeybees in their house, you do not want to kill them. And, and 90% of the, uh, the exterminators out there will tell you to call me anyway because it's not, not good for their business. But there are some fly-by-night types that will say, oh, yeah, I could take care of that for you and try to take your money, and then you won't hear from them again because they got your money and you got a mess. So if you ever hear anybody got honeybees, you tell them, give me a call. I'll take care of them. As far as honeybees go, a lot of people don't know how to recognize a honeybee. Honeybee versus wasp. Everything is either a wasp or it's a bee, or it just stings. This is a honeybee. A honeybee, I like to think of it, is the same color of honey. It is that golden, brownish, tannish, just it's a beautiful color. It's like a sunrise. You know, it's it, bees are awesome. Uh, they got a segmented body. They're very fuzzy. If you look at their antennae, they come up and then bend forward. And they use those to feel. Um, I mean, they've got to use those to, to navigate their hive. I mean, if you want to ever see, you can imagine what the, if you close your eyes right now, you can imagine what the uh, the inside of a hive looks like. It's just dark. Just like your eyes are closed, you know, it's like you got to work your way through and in the, in the, over thousands and thousands of bees, uh, a hive. We'll go back here and take a look quick. Where'd it go? Yeah, if you look at those, if you look at there, they, um, there's could be 40,000 bees, 50,000 bees in a, in a colony. And they all work through in the dark to navigate their way. So anyway, this is a honeybee. This would be a wasp. <clears throat> this is, uh, it could be a yellow jacket. Uh, it could be a ground bee. It could be a paper wasp. Uh, there's multiple different names, and they look very similar. There's uh, about 420 different bees, wasps in our area. Honey bee, there's only one. Uh, wasps, there's hundreds. Uh, the... Um, then there's several other bees. There's there's sweat bees, there's uh, bumblebees, there's carpenter bees, and I don't have those in here. We're just talking about wasps. Uh, this would be a mud dauber. Bees, they can all sting. They don't have the stinger of a honeybee. They all have smooth stingers, so they can sting again and again. They'll sting, and they'll pull the stinger right out and fly to the next spot and sting again. Uh, they can regenerate their venom. Uh, honeybees on venom on the venom side, they only make so much in their life because they're only going to use it once. Let's see, this is a the home of the bee. This is what you would see if you saw honeybees. You look at that tree. There's that little knot hole, and you'll see bees on a good day, sunny. Lots of flowers out. You'll see hundreds of bees flying in and out, in and out, in and out. You also might see a little hole in the corner of your soffit of your house. Bees flying in and out and in and out. You'll never see their nests. They like to be protected. They like to be inside because they plan on living there for generations. Uh, maybe not generations, our generations, you know, not hundreds of years, but uh, the generations of the bees themselves. So they move in and they don't and they want to keep the house. They take care of it. They protect it. They bring in what's called propolis. Propolis is tree resins. They bring they scrape resins off of mostly pop, poplar trees in their area and bring back the resins and they use it as a varnish to to cover everything uh, inside the hive. 
So if you got up close to this, you can see where it looks like it's been varnished quite a bit. And if you look at that knot hole, uh, you can see where the, the outside rim of that hole has been varnished with this, this propolis. And it's it's really good stuff. It's antibacterial, antiviral. Uh, there's people that use it to put, make toothpaste with. They use it to uh, make tinctures with. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in a beehive. Mud dauber again. The mud dauber uh, nest is actually on the left. They make these tubes. And you can see these on vertical surfaces. And they will be about each one of those tubes is probably the size of a large crayon. They, uh, they'll bring in uh, insects. They'll bring in insects, put an insect in there, and then lay an egg on top, bring in another insect, and lay another egg, and they'll just keep making these tubes longer. You'll probably have a dozen young mud daubers come out of those tubes when it's time. Uh, the one on the right is another mud-type wasp. That's probably no bigger than a golf ball. And you usually see these in, um, like, under window sills or up, underneath uh, the soffit or something. Usually someplace where it's very protected and you put your hand in there and you're like, oh, how does mud get in here? And you don't even realize it's a nest. Uh, these would be hornet nests. Uh, it looks like if we look at the one on the right on the bottom there, it looks like there's a black and white one. That would be a bald faced hornet. But these nests, are very similar, constructed very similar in uh, as far as across all the wasp species that make nests like this. This is uh, a, a mud, and you can see the, the striations in that one on the left better. In each one of those little striations, one wasp went out or one hornet and brought back materials and, and glued it onto the hive. Now, as opposed to the 40 to 50,000 bees in a honeybee nest, you're only going to see a couple hundred wasps in one of these, but they're much more dangerous than a honeybee nest. You're going to get a lot more, get a lot more trouble, a lot more stings, a lot more hurting if you bother one of these. Oh, and on these, ground bees. Ground bees actually build this same type of nest in the ground as they excavate dirt and they just build one of these underground. So if you know, you have one of these, you got to dig them up, and that's what you'll find. Same deal. This is a mason bee, and when you see these these houses that they sell, you know, save the bee kind of thing, uh, this is what you can get at the store, this is what they sell online everywhere. Everybody says, save the bee, put one of these bee houses up. And this is the type of bee that will move in. This is what's called a mason bee. Mason bees are great for pollination. So if you've got something in your yard that you want to pollinate, if you've got a couple apple trees or something or blueberries or, or whatever else, I recommend you get one of these. Mason bees don't travel as far as honeybees. Uh, they'll, they'll stay fairly local. Uh, you'll get one or two the first year, and the next year this thing will be full. They, uh, they'll come out in the rain. They'll come out in the cold. They'll, they'll do pollination in weather that honeybees usually wouldn't. Honeybees really are a, a, a fair weather type of bee. But you can see this. This is this looks almost just like a honeybee, except the coloring is a little bit different. They're a lot more fuzzier on the back end. And on the legs there are different. And a lot of them come in iridescent colors. They're really neat to look at. So a little bit on the history of beekeeping. This is this is kind of an area where they started. Actually, let's see. I think they started in the logs first. To be to my guess, they started in uh, in tubes like this because the naturally where they used to find them is in in trees. So you just take a tree, lay it on its side, and the bees will move in. You hollow it out, and you can see where it's. Uh, the one on the bottom is cut right in half, so all they have to do is go in there and, and open it right up. Uh, they got some standing on end there. Uh, they used to, if you can see how doors were cut in the front, they used to make them like that. They'd actually climb trees, make a door like that in a tree, hollow out the inside of the tree, the heartwood, 
and then put the door back on. And hopefully next year they would see bees move into the, the tree that they hollowed out. And they would do it 20 feet in the air because that's where bees like to live. Uh, honeybees like to live is 20 feet in the air. Uh, bees have been cut out and now they're on the ground. Works the same. Uh, and then came the skep. The skep is like a uh, a reed basket. And a good skep maker could make a skep in about 10 hours. So you got about 40 hours there on the left and uh, maybe a little less on the right because they're kind of some couple of them are kind of short. And that's usually a structure that you can make these skeps and they have to be undercover. Uh, sometimes they coat them in mud. Sometimes they put um, the roofs over them because they can get wet and that causes problems for the bees. We don't get to use these anymore. And there's been laws in place since, I don't know, either the late 1800s maybe, early 1900s, that uh, bees are managed beehive colonies have to have what are called movable combs so that they can be inspected for diseases and other issues. And in these, there is none of that. What would happen is the bees move in, uh, and then you lift one up, you knock, you smoke the bees all out of it, and you put the bees into an empty, uh, into an empty skep, and then you take all the wax, all the comb, and all the little bees out, and destroy it all, and and, and filter out the honey, and use whatever else for other things. I'm sure they used every bit of it. These are what's called top bar hives. This was the beginning of, of um, movable combs. And if you open these up, there's it's covered in bars, probably about an inch and a half wide or so. And the bees will attach their comb to the bottom of the bars and, and the, uh, the sides are angled. If the sides are straight, bees will attach their comb to the sides. Uh, they'll even, but if it's on an angle like this, they tend not to attach it. So it just, they attach the, the bar that's on top and you lift the bar out and you can take a honeycomb out. After that, they've come up with ways to frame the honey. And you can see on the right, this is a Langstroth hive. This was built in late 1800s. Uh, and that's when what was called was the B space. Uh, was discovered and the bee space is the amount of space that the bees leave between honeycombs uh, if it's too small they fill it in with the propolis with the resins and if it's the space is too big they'll fill it in with uh, honeycomb and so they've developed these hives and put in uh, a way to move these combs and give them strength so the bees will make a comb in each one of those frames and this is our modern way of beekeeping this is a mobile system we can open it up inspect it uh, i say modern even though it's over 100 years old nothing has changed in that time because it's cheap to make uh, and it works well and it is exceptionally good for uh, what's called migratory beekeeping oh, and there it is what is migratory beekeeping? It is where people put lots of hives on trucks and trailers, and they move them to industrial monocrops, which I wish they didn't, but you know what? That's what feeds many people. Uh, these monocrops are places, are food deserts, really, for um, any natural insect or thing and if you look at this uh the big picture on the top it looks like a field of maybe cotton or something or flowers but what it really is is those it's a almond grove out in california those are huge trees and there's one time a year when there's food available for insects it is when they're in bloom it is the biggest uh migration of honeybees in the world it is out to california uh, I think uh, two or three hives in the country go out there. And every year you hear of a truck that has crashed and there's bees all over the highway. This is probably where they're headed. Uh, pollination is huge, huge business. Uh, the, there's commercial beekeepers that move honeybees everywhere. 
Uh, you know, they'll one time they'll be in uh, New York, then they'll be out in California, then they'll be in uh, Tennessee or Florida, and they're up up north, down south, left, right, everywhere. It's migratory beekeeping, and that is one of the niches that um, some beekeepers fall into. Usually, the big commercial beekeepers. A lot of these things would disappear without honeybees. So for the bees that do not travel across country, because they do, they'll follow the seasons, and they'll be in a nice place most of the time. But bees still need a time to, to rest, and it would be the winter for the bees. There's a tree full of bees. They didn't move. They didn't leave for the winter. As I said, they set up a shop, set up a home to live there for uh, generations. They will sit there. They will cluster together. They will huddle together and eat their honey all year long. That's why we are able to get honey from honeybees is because they produce so much honey. They work hard, very hard to make honey in order to survive the winter. Here's what it would look like if you took two of those boxes, those Langstroth honeybee boxes apart. In the winter, you can see all the bees clustered, clustered together uh, into a, a sphere. That's probably the size of a basketball right there, and there's probably 50,000 bees sitting there. This is a page out of an old book where it shows you what they're doing inside of that. And they will keep it 96 degrees all year long, right in the center of that. And they'll stay warm, they'll shiver, and eat honey. How is honey made? Uh, bees go out, they collect nectar from the flowers. Uh, in the process, they, they are a, um, they like to select the same flower again and again and again, which is why they work great for pollination, is because they'll go from an apple blossom to an apple blossom. They'll go from a squash blossom to a squash blossom. They'll go from uh, whatever they're working on. Even if there's something else, other flowers in the area, they will stick. To just one thing. So that's why they're they're a natural they're a great pollinator. So they'll collect nectar, they'll bring it back to their hive, and they'll put it into their honeycomb. Now it's kind of like maple like making maple syrup. They it is very thin, it is low sugar content, so they have to dry it out. I mean, obviously they don't have big fires and chimneys to to evaporate the water off of the sugar. Uh, so they use their wings. And they uh, they fan their wings across it and move it around and slowly evaporate the the nectar. Uh, they'll add enzymes to it to sh change the types of sugar in the nectar. And eventually, when they put wax cappings across it, kind of like on the left, you can see many of those cells are covered in wax. And underneath them, the, that wax capping is is good honey because they've got it down to probably about 18 or less percent of water, which makes it a good, thick, delicious honey. Here are the frames again. This is a radial extractor. And what happens is you take the frames out of the hive, you cut the, the, uh, the wax cappings off the top of the cells, and you put it into an extractor. This thing spins uh, at very fast speed, and the honey just flies out of, that, uh, out of the cells. Uh, up against the outside of that barrel that it's in, and then it gets poured out. Uh oh, what happened? My pointer stopped working. There we go. It goes into a barrel, and honey has this unique property of self clarification. So, I'll, if you ever see raw, unfiltered honey, it is unfiltered because what happens is it sits in a barrel and all the junk goes to the bottom. All the heavy stuff goes to the bottom uh, and all the light stuff, like the little bits of wax and little bits of bees that might get stuck in there, float to the surface. And then you just draw the honey off the middle and you get a nice clear honey right there, just like that. This would be a, the, the light honey would probably be a spring honey and the, uh, the dark honey would probably be a midsummer. Usually fall honey is much darker and more robust in flavor. I like the dark honeys myself. 
Let's see what bees do the work. Worker bees. Worker bees do the work. We got a worker in the top left. Worker bees are all female. Female bees, they do all the nectar collecting. They make the honey. Uh, they tend the queen. They, um, they do all the housekeeping. They do everything. The queen bee, up in the top right, all she does is lay eggs all day long, and she just gets tended on. She's in the dark her, almost her entire life. She gets, um, she gets to leave the hive twice in her life, maybe only once. Chances are twice. Once to go get mated. Uh, she will mate with up to uh, a couple dozen drones, have a, a good mix of offspring. She only goes out once, and then she stores all the sperm that she receives from the drones in a gland and releases uh, a couple of sperm every time she lays an egg. Well, not every time. Uh, it depends. If she, if she fertilizes an egg, it becomes a worker bee. If she does not fertilize an egg, it becomes a drone. We've got a drone right there on the uh, bottom right. Drones have those big eyes. And they have a great sense of smell, so they can find the queen in flight. And that's all they do. That's all they're good for is to mate with the queen. Uh, once they do, uh, they mate, and then they're, they're, uh, they don't have a stinger. They have a penis. And this penis explodes and breaks off of their body, and they die. So if they're successful, they die. Uh, if not, they go back to the hive and they tell stories and they do whatever they do and and uh, eat honey. Uh, when winter comes along, the worker bees, the girls, kick them out of the hive uh, to their doom. They will not survive the winter. The queen bee does not rule. Uh, she does not rule the hive. I mean, that's kind of like you hear queen, you think monarchy. Uh, no, the worker bees choose the queen they uh they decide which bee is going to or which egg will become a queen uh they decide if the queen is going to lay a drone or if she's going to lay a worker egg because the drones have a larger size cell in the in the uh the wax foundation and they build the wax the wax comb so they get to choose if they make a large uh comb or if they make a small comb and if it's a small one they, the queen will lay fertilized eggs to become workers if it's a large comb they will she will lay unfertilized eggs be, to become uh drone bees so the and then if the worker bees don't like how the queen is performing if she's not if she's, she's damaged she has a broken leg or something's wrong with her wing or some other thing they will actually kill the queen and they will raise a new one uh and they can select which egg that will become a new become a queen by feeding what is called royal jelly. Royal jelly or queen food, royal food, bee milk. Uh, bee milk is what it is, and it is a milk, and it's one of the few insects that produce milk just like mammals do. They have a, they eat food, and they have a specific gland that produces this milk, and it's a whole food. To, uh, and that's what the queen lives on her entire life. All bees receive bee milk for the first three days of their lives as, as larvae. But if they continue to feed that larvae bee milk their entire lives, they are queens. So it's, it's a pretty cool thing that can happen. So if for some reason the queen dies, they can make another one. Uh, the other time the queen can leave is when the hive swarms. And you might have seen this. You might have seen pictures of it. Uh, you'll see a group of bees hanging from a bare branch. There could be probably ten to 15,000 bees in that little section right there, a little ball of bees. One queen bee in there. There might be a couple of drones. And this is how the colonies reproduce. They don't, rep they, uh, you, honeybees don't re reproduce like mammals where they can, you know, they make one, one young and that one goes off. Um, they don't reproduce like uh, wasps where one queen goes out and then that one queen in the spring makes a whole new nest. They re reproduce by splitting their hive. Uh, they will take half the, half the colony, will leave the hive, venture out with the old queen, and find a new place to live. 
and set up a new new home. And the other half will stay behind and make a new queen for that place. But in the meantime, when they do leave the hive, they don't really know where they're going, so they do what is called bivouac and set up a camp and look for a new place. When they find a new place, this whole group of bees will get up, and they will fly to that new place and do what they do. <clears throat> Another great question was, what can I do to keep the bees? Number one, stop spraying your lawn. You don't need to have a green lawn. A nice, beautiful green lawn is a desert. It's not just a desert for honeybees. It's a desert for butterflies and other insects that do pollination, that create a diversity. Uh, you don't want to spray your lawn because, because when you do, it prevents weeds from growing up. And weeds have flowers. Uh, you have a nice, diverse green lawn, and then sometimes you'll have a flush of pink or a flush of yellow, or a flush of blue. It's called pollinator turf, and it is very important. There's so many lawns in the world that, well, maybe not in the world, but definitely in America, where we have to have that perfect green lawn. I remember my grandfather sitting out in his yard, sitting in his shorts with one of those long uh, digging things to get dandelions out of his yard and try to get the roots real deep and manually try to have the nice looking lawn. It was a, it was a little frustration, I'm sure, for him, because they just they want to come up. Uh, but I know that now that uh, when I see a nice green lawn, I know that it might as well be sand. There's just nothing going to grow there. Uh, so that's number one. Another one, if you're going to plant for bees, you can't really plant for uh, you can't plant just flowers. I mean, you can, uh, because again, they, they like a diversity over time. They don't like a diversity at once. They want to see one color, one type of flower bloom now, and then next week, a different type of flower. Uh, so I recommend trees. Uh, basswood or linden is a great tree in our area. It grows great in, uh, in urban areas and produces lots of flowers. And because the vertical uh, style of a tree, you'll end up with three to ten times as much nectar produced per acre than if you did just a patch of flowers. See, how to become a beekeeper. Oh, you know one else I want to say about um, honeybees? They travel up to five miles away. To, to find to find flowers to find to find food and they'll do it on a regular basis and I should have mentioned it earlier when I was talking about honey was one bee will create one tenth of a teaspoon one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey so it takes twelve bees to make one teaspoon um, of honey it's really amazing. It takes a lot of bees to make a jar of honey. And I got a jar sitting here. I don't know if you can still see my picture, but that's a pound of honey. And uh it takes a lot of bees' lives to make a pound of honey. This is very special stuff. And every time I spill a drop on the ground, I cringe because I know how much work it takes. But they'll go up to five miles. They fly about 15 miles an hour. So they can do a round trip in half an hour, 45 minutes, stop, collect some, some food, collect some nectar, collect some pollen, and come back to the hive. And five miles is about 80 square miles. So if you see a bee in your yard, it could come from quite a distance away. You can't think there's just going to be a hive nearby. They might say, you've got a great spot, and they'll tell all their friends, and they'll all show up. So how can you become a beekeeper? I recommend joining a club. As mentioned earlier, uh, there's a Syracuse Area Beekeepers Club. You know, I don't know if that one's still meeting. Uh, it met once in December, but uh, that that is at the Fayetteville Library, so you can call them and ask what's going on. Also, I have Central New York Beekeepers, which meets right here in Bridgeport. 
that is the second Monday of every month. Um, and there is a president of the club out in Ariskany, which is uh, Ariskany is near Westmoreland off the thruway. And there's another club out there, and we all have classes. You can all sign up for classes. Uh, if you want to see what's going on in the last weekend of May, I always have a gathering out at my place that people can just show up and, and uh, you know, see what it looks like inside a hive, see what a bee yard looks like, see what it takes to be a beekeeper, the kind of the equipment that's used. Oh, meta awareness. <laughs> this was this was part of my uh, my art of uh, is art of Zen in beekeeping. I think was my original title. And I mentioned earlier about my bee suits. That's the one thing I sell. When I was um, when I was uh, using duct tape to protect myself. My wife looked at me and just felt bad for me. She felt sorry for what I was doing. So my birthday, she went in with my parents and bought uh, the most expensive bee suit imaginable at the time. And blessed me with it. And when I put that thing on, you know, beforehand, the bees were nuts. They were stinging me constantly or constantly trying to get me. When I put this suit on, they stopped. I figured, wow, these bees don't want to sting anymore. They uh, they know they can't sting me because I've got this brand new, this nice suit that's going to keep me safe. And and I was calm and, and the bees were calm. Then I realized, you know what? The bees weren't calm because they knew I was wearing a suit. The bees didn't know what I was wearing and they didn't care. What they realized or what I realized was that I wasn't, producing pheromones anymore fear pheromones i didn't go into this flight and uh, fight or flight reaction anymore i didn't have adrenaline going i was calm i was breathing calm uh, and because i didn't have adrenaline going my respirations were were slower less per minute i wasn't producing uh, co2 from my breath and all these things because bees communicate quite a bit by sense of smell by pheromones, uh, I wasn't giving them reason to be afraid. They just thought I was part of the hive. So I'd go out there and be relaxed and calm, and and the bees wouldn't bother me. That's why at the beginning you can see my children holding, you know, tons of bees in their hands, and and uh, didn't have a problem because I was I've because of that bee suit brought the calmness to me, the relaxation and the safety. I've been able to pass that that calmness onto my kids. And it has changed quite a bit the way I deal with people. Sometimes I would feel anxiety, uh, feel overwhelmed in, in uh, you know, or, um, you know, uh, afraid to talk to somebody because in, in that, that anxiety would come up and that adrenaline and that flight or fright uh, thing, you know, I can, you know, if something's going to happen, people want to be confrontational. I'd feel that adrenaline come up and and uh i learned from the bees how to keep that down how to breathe right and how to how to just be calm and it has changed my interactions with people unbelievably it, uh meta awareness is up on the screen meta awareness is ever read a read a book and you get to the end of a page and you realize wow i didn't I don't remember a word that I just read. That was a lapse of meta awareness, and that realization was when the meta awareness came back in. It's where you can uh, think of a thought, where you recognize, almost stand outside yourself, and see what you're thinking. And with beekeeping, in order to remain calm. Um, I have to maintain meta awareness. I have to be focused. Uh, ADD is another thing I've I've had in the past, and this has really helped me quite a bit because you know what? When I'm sitting there working with bees, 
And all of a sudden, my mind goes off onto something else, either past or, or future or some worry that's going on in my life or something I'm planning in the future. I'm not paying attention to the bees, and the bees know it, and I get stung. So it's like, it's a, uh, it's a process. Uh, so I have to intentionally pay attention to my thoughts and be focused. And the bees are a tool to help me become more focused for longer and longer amounts of time. And, and be aware of, of my breath and my breathing, and my calmness. And so it's great. They, they do a lot with, um, with veterans. Uh, veteran groups have, have recognized this. And there's a lot of programs out there to put veterans with beekeepers to set them up with colonies and hives to help with PTSD and the like. And, you know, it's not just vets that have PTSD. There's a lot of people that have been abused or have, have other things happen in their lives where they have regular triggers. Trigger is a big word now in society. Is you going to be triggered? Um, and that all a trigger does is set off that fight or flight reaction. And you know what? We're not going to get rid of triggers in the world. But you know what we can do? We can help each other be calm. And through beekeeping, it's great. And it's a class I teach. You come out and, and we can talk about that. And, uh, we're in the yard and, and how, to, how to do it. Bees breathe. And this is a little video of a bee breathing. He's got his head stuck in the comb, probably packing some pollen or some, some nectar down in there. Or maybe it's feeding a little egg that might be down in there. It could be feeding an egg. But that's how bees breathe, in and out just like we do. They don't have lungs like that we do. We have, they have what's called spiracles, and they, they're like little holes or little ports in their body. So they expand and contract and draw air in through those little holes. The handful of bees, they're pretty cool. Uh, here's a picture of a, uh, this reminds me of, I want you to go out. I want you to eat a lawn chair. And this is your homework when springtime rolls around. This is part of the zen of beekeeping. Get out there, lay in the grass. See, this has not had come on sprayed on it. There's a lot of clover in this grass. It's a great source of nectar and pollen for bees, especially early in the year, along with dandelions. Dandelions are one of the very first foods that come out in somebody's yard for, for bees to uh, collect food from. <clears throat> and get out there with your lawn chair, set by a field, and just relax and and listen and, and watch the insects, all the pollinators that are out there. They're, they're amazing. They'll go about their business and they won't bother you because they're there to collect food and not to get stung. This is part of my bee yard. Um, if anybody wants to you camp out in my bee yard next to some hives and smell the honey being made, uh, I had my son out there. He didn't want his picture taken again. So there's that. I teach classes right out of my garage. A lot of things you see in the pictures here are on that table. You can do some good honey tastings. There's so many. There's a great variety of honey tastings, a great variety of honey. Most of the time, people don't even, uh, they don't even um, like honey when they come in. And then they taste honey, and they're like, wow, this is what real honey tastes like. Because the stuff you get in the store for $3 for a pound uh, versus what you get from a, a farm stand or uh, somebody's, you know, your local neighborhood beekeeper who has raw and filtered honey is not the same. You're going to have to pay $10, $12 for a pound of honey from a beekeeper where you get it from the store for three bucks. That stuff comes from out of the country. Uh, a lot of people feed sugar syrups. They'll take all the honey and feed sugar syrups back to the bees. That sugar syrup, <clears throat> excuse me, ends up in the honey. It is... Uh, pasteurized and overheated so it stays liquid on the shelf uh, raw honey will crystallize on you um, if you do get raw honey another point to, to remember is don't put it in the microwave uh, don't heat it up I mean that's what you do to liquefy it you, and you do heat it up to liquefy it but you don't want it any more than what a hot tub would be a hot tub is about 104 degrees you don't want to go over that it's the honey has enzymes and minerals in it just like we do uh, if we get a fever of 108, we're dead because our bodies break down. Same thing with the honey. If you get up that temperature in the honey, the honey can break down. So that's it. Uh, any questions? There's uh, Here's some of my information. Uh, my website there. Check it out. 
there's a calendar of events on there. You can contact me anytime. If you've got, uh, if you got bees in your area, or you've got questions or you, you know what, write down my number. If uh, you see a bee at your house and you wonder what it is, just send me a picture. I'll tell you what's, what it is and what, uh, what's going on. Um, if you want to take a class or if you want to learn about beekeeping, give me a call, send me an email, whatever. Take a screenshot. Yeah, that's that's my card right there, front and back. So if I run into you, I'm going to give you a card anyway because it's all word of mouth. All right. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. And uh, we do have uh, one question. First question is, do you offer beekeeping classes for teens? Absolutely. Beekeeping for all ages. I've got extra suits. I've got uh, extra protective gear for, for anybody that needs it. Uh, I'll lend if you come out. There is uh, right now. I'm putting together beekeeping classes uh, out in uh, uh, Riskini at the uh, it's at the Cornell Cooperative Extension. Anybody can go. Uh, that would be midyorkbeekeepers.com, and uh, they're offering classes in March and April. It's a Saturday, a full day class, which is which gives you a great overview overview. And then um, you can come to my place. You can get some hands on on uh, on some bees. You can try it out, see what it's like before you actually invest in a colony, in a hive yourself. Uh, or you can go out to the other Riskini out there, that that club out there, and uh, MidYorkBeekeepers.com, and uh, do one out there. Cool. So uh, next question is from Deborah Rossi, and she asks, "How long do honeybees live generally?" Oh yeah, 45 days. So in the summer, a worker bee, the female, will work herself to death, about 45 days. Uh, in the winter, they live a little bit longer because all they're doing is sitting inside, hanging out, eating some honey and trying to stay warm. They can live up to 100 days, 180 days over winter. The queen bee, she's a little bit different. She can live up to about five years. So you could have the same queen bee, and like I said, she goes out and mates once and and, and uh, gathers enough sperm to to filter or to filter to uh, to fertilize fertilize eggs and she can lay up to three thousand eggs a day. So that forty five days, there's bees constantly being born and there's constant bees constantly dying, but that uh, forty thousand bees in a hive tends to maintain pretty good. It can lower to about twenty thousand in the winter when it comes out of spring. Uh, to about seventy to eighty thousand at the peak of the, the flower season. Cool. The next, so the next question is from Nancy Wolcott, and she asks: Can different varieties of bees exist together in the same yard? If she were to get a bee house or bee houses, bee homes, different varieties. Absolutely, you can have you can have uh, dozens of different varieties of bees in in one place. There's some. Uh, Let's see, there's bumblebees. Bumblebees can live in small areas, like underneath a step or under you know, brick in the backyard someplace. They make a little, uh, if you put a clay pot upside down, they'll find it and make a, a place in there. Uh, you can, uh, carpenter bees, they're the ones that drill nice little holes in your uh, the wood on your house. Uh, you don't want them there. You got to get them out. They do a lot of damage. Um, the mason bees, you put a mason bee house out there. You put a honey... Uh, honeybee colony out there uh, you have multiple different because they don't all eat the same thing they all forage on different stuff so yeah you can have plenty of different uh, a nice variety out there get your lawn chair out and watch all that they do okay this is a a question about a different insect but uh uh i, I knowing nothing i'm assuming that it, it, it relates to bees somehow uh, it's from Mike Lyons, and he asks, "How do you manage uh, varroa mites?" And I guess first off, what are what are varroa mites? Oh, yeah, varroa mites. That is that definitely relates to bees big time. <clears throat> here, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen first. Here, there we go. Um, the varroa mite. Um, it's kind of like a bee tick. So if we go out into the yard, into the tall grass, and we get a tick, what happens? We get a little bug on us that 
burrows its head into our skin and feeds off of us, right? The varroa mite does the same thing to a bee. It burrows its head into its body and feeds off the bee. Um, to manage, I don't, there, there's uh, treatment beekeepers and non-treatment beekeepers. I'm a non-treatment beekeepers. I don't like putting, because uh, treatment beekeepers use the pesticide in a beehive to get rid of the mites. Um, you're supposed to do most, most of the treatments go on without honey, but so it doesn't get into our food. And it's supposed to, a lot of them are supposed to be food safe. So I don't worry about it too much. But for myself, uh, basically what needs to happen is there's a life cycle of the, of the varroa mite. Part of their life cycle has to be on their brood. So brood, so honeybees go through metamorphosis. We usually um, think of, of butterflies go through metamorphosis. They make it a, a, an egg, a larvae, a cocoon, and then emerge as an adult butterfly. Bees do the same thing. There's an egg, there's a larvae, there's a cocoon, then there's an adult bee. The varroa mites have to live on the larvae stage of the honeybee life cycle for a little while. And then what's called a brood break, a brood break is when a hive does not have any larvae in there. And when you do that, the varroa mites can't survive. So you, you eliminate most of them because they can only be in the, what's called the phoretic stage, which is when the bee, when the varroa mite are not on the larvae, but are traveling around on the bodies of the adult bees feeding off of them. Uh, but they have to, in order to do a full life cycle for a varroa mite, they have to feed off an adult and off a larvae to get the proper nutrition in order to survive. So there's, there's a few different things. There's chemicals you can put in there and there's a few, um, physical things you can do to manage their their population but that's a big deal and it's a they're a just like mosquitoes are vectors of diseases like west nile and triple e there are multiple different viruses that travel around with the varroa mite and because of migratory beekeeping uh, those viruses come from all over the country all over the world and just get everywhere you know you can see that with coronavirus how it started in the other side of the planet and it just travels so fast because people move around. Same thing with the bees. The bees move around, the varroa mites move with the bees and so do the viruses. So it is definitely honeybee related. Okay, we've got time for one or two more questions. Uh, so the next question is from Patty Black and she asks, if you have a small lot, how much space do you need or what, what's the minimum space required to keep bees? Uh, one of the pictures I like to share, I don't have it available right now, but one of the pictures I like to share is an apartment building where they have a beehive out on the patio. Uh, obviously they have no space yet. They have bees. Uh, you don't need space. Uh, you only need good neighbors that are not going to say I'm getting stung by your bees. But in reality, honeybees travel again, they three to five miles from where their hive is to collect food. So they're not going to go in your own yard. You don't have to worry about having enough flowers in your own yard. They don't have to be in your neighbor's yard. They'll go quite a distance. So really, all you got to do is have good neighbors. Cool. So the next question is from Donna Regan, and she asks uh, that she's seen, she says that she's seen organic honey for sale. Does that refer to the how the hives are kept or the nature of what the bees are feeding on and she says that you know it seems if the honey if the honey bees have a radius of five miles it'd be difficult to control exactly where they are collecting nectar right so in the united states there really is i think there might be a spot out in hawaii but really in the united states to be organically certified you have to know that the ground that plants are grown in hasn't been touched by chemicals in I think something like seven years. Uh, you have to, have, it's got to go through a lot of certifications and considering that bees fly 80 square miles, you got to know every bit of that 80 square miles and it's just impossible to do. So organic honey is either labeled wrong or it comes from a country that has different standards and say, oh, you put organic on anything. So no, uh, the best, the best bet to do is if, you find a local beekeeper, find out what they do, what their practices are, where they keep their bees, and then you can get a good idea. 
So know your beekeeper, know where your honey comes from. Cool. Awesome. Well, we've got one more time for, for one final comment and then I'm, and then I will say thank you to Bill and then we'll throw it over back to Mary Beth. Uh, Mike Lyons says, if you want good neighbors, give them free honey for Christmas. So everybody has plenty of time to get their hives going, get some honey, uh, good to go for, for all your neighbors uh, this Christmas uh, coming up. Um, all right. Well, Bill, thank you very much for uh, joining us with tonight. That was uh, quite informative and uh, quite eye-opening. And I am glad uh, that I am not a bee because that sounds like a brutal life. <laughs> a brutal life. Um, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's rough. I th thanks for having me. Uh, I know I went longer, but I, like I said, there's just so much to talk about. Join one of my meetings on uh, on Monday night. You can find it under the uh, on my website there under events, and there, there's Zoom meetings too, so you can join me there and talk more about. And there's just so much to talk about, and it's just it's a passion. So anyway, ask me questions all the time. Give me a call. I'll I'll talk your ear off. Awesome. Yeah, we'll we'll link to um, your website and some of the other stuff uh, when we post the video up on uh, OFL's website uh, as well. All right, I'm going to throw it over to Mary Beth, who's going to tell you about what else the other speakers we have coming up during the rest of our spring 2022 season. So take it away, Mary Beth. Thanks so much, Bill, for joining us here tonight and sharing your fascinating story of bees. On Thursday, February 10th, Lauren Edline will be our speaker. She's a nurse practitioner and clinical herbalist who has a primary care practice and is a member of the SUNY Upstate Medical Center Internal Medicine Group. She's also a member of the American Herbalist, herbalist Guild, and she will explore how we can integrate holistic methods of wellness into our daily lives. On March 10th, Holly Ann Grant will be our, our guest speaker. Her topic will be birds and how you can make your backyard more wildlife friendly. She'll also give us some bird identification tips and tell us about a citizen science project, a bunch of citizen science projects at Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where she is a pro pro project assistant. You can find updates on the series at our website, strathmorespeakers.com. And thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope to see you again in February. Night.